We're so glad that you're worshiping God with us. And let's go to God in prayer because as we have sung this morning, we go to God with joy and with boldness. Father, thank you for paving the way through the blood of your one and only son. That because of his death on the cross for each one of us, that you have become our father in heaven as we have placed our faith in Jesus. And you are available to us for us to open up our hearts, to share what's on our mind, and even to present our families and our loved ones to you in prayer. And Lord, as you have designed us for worship, you've made us to worship you. We pray that we would continue to fulfill that incredible design and purpose for each one of our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I really thank God for Andrew and Flora, for their two boys, for Paul and Ian. And what a great celebration that we could have as a church family for this at-home child dedication. And I appreciate the fact that as Andrew and Ian, as Andrew and Flora were holding Ian and their prayer before the Lord, that they said, God, we want your spirit to help direct and to guide his steps. And I love that because the Apostle Paul and the New Testament and the Bible in, in its entirety is all about our need for the Spirit of God to direct our steps, to guide our choices, so that we could live a life that is wise and that's not foolish, a life that is godly with God and not godless without him. And so even as we depend upon the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God is the one who takes up residence. He literally moves into your life and mine individually and as a sacred community. Because the Spirit of God is God's empowering presence that enables us to do all that God expects as we embrace Jesus as our Savior and as our King. And one of the most powerful and one of the most amazing in staggering ways in which the Spirit of God shows his power is by the way that he shapes and reshapes and molds and remolds each one of us into the likeness of his one and only Son. And the place in which he starts that is right where you are. It's in your home. It's with our family and with our loved ones, with our moms and dads, with our sons and daughters, with our spouse, that those that we live with, that's like, as it were, front and center, the first opportunity where God wants to demonstrate the power of his spirit to help us to do exactly what he requires so that Jesus is honored and exalted and lifted up by the way that we live. You see, we've been living life at home. We learn from home, we work from home, we exercise from home, we create from home, we bake from home. We do everything in our life from home for this extended period of time. And it's not simply a temporary short-term measure because of the global pandemic, but it's a reminder of where life is really lived at its heart and soul. It's between husband and wife, sons and daughters, moms and dads, siblings, and how we relate to one another with the people that God has made us a part of in terms of that household. Our relationships are what we've come to encounter at home more than ever before these last nine months. Because for many of us, these are essentially the sum total, the entirety of our social contacts. These are the, the people in our lives that we have been around the clock 24-7, 365, at least for the last nine months and for the next probably three, four, five months down the road, where we have been together. And for some, it's been an added bonus and a tremendous joy. And for others, it's been a a real challenge, and something that has maybe stretched us more than ever before, and maybe even for others, it's been downright awful. It's been agonizing, and you just can't wait for things to get back to normal. And so wherever we are on the spectrum, as it were, of where life is like at home, 
This is really the opportunity that God gives to us to put the gospel into practice. And it starts with my relationship with Helen. It starts, if you're married, with your relationship with your spouse. Because God pictures our spiritual connection with Jesus through our mutual devotion in marriage. That is where it starts. That is the beginning point for the godly relationships that he wants to produce within our households. You see, ideally, what we say with our words and what others see inside of our homes, ideally, what they hear from us and what they see in us has this powerful chemistry and blending and coming together to make a strong proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that the gospel is not something simply what they hear from our words, but they actually see it pictured and illustrated and visualized through our relationships at home between husbands and wives and moms and dads and sons and daughters as we work and relate to one another. You see, we're going to see this morning that a spirit-formed marriage that displays a Jesus-directed relationship creates a God-blessed legacy. A spirit-formed marriage, and that's what the Spirit of God wants to do. He wants to enable me to be a godly husband. He wants to empower Helen to be a God-fearing wife. He wants to empower you to be the kind of son, the kind of daughter, the kind of mom, the kind of dad, the kind of spouse that is chiseled and shaped by the Spirit of God that points others to Jesus, that it's all about how Jesus is orchestrating and directing and moving our relationships toward one another. And when that happens, then we leave behind the greatest treasure of all. And that is a God-blessed legacy. You see, our marriage, God wants to be useful and instrumental in his hands, to bless the world in which we live as we show others how God has blessed us in our relationship with Jesus. You see, our marriage is real and our family life is actual. This is literal reality. It's in real life. But the reality of our marriage and of our relationships with one another within the four walls of our home are not the ultimate reality. They're a parable, they're a picture, they're a signpost that points others to a greater reality. And that's the relationship that you and I enjoy with Jesus as our Savior. You see, if I talk to one of our young couples who is maybe thinking about marriage or a couple who has been recently married and they're just taking off, as it were, in their life together or maybe even someone who's been married for decades and and seems to be searching for something within their marriage that is missing. And if I were to ask them, what is it that you want in marriage? And I would say, I would venture to guess that 9 out of 10 would say, "I I just want to be happy. I just want to be satisfied. I want to be fulfilled. I want to wake up with a smile on my face, thanking God for the person that I sleep next to. I want to go to bed at night full of gratitude for the man and the woman that I've pledged my life to. Whoever you've committed yourself to for a lifetime or you're thinking about that possibility, that's your desire. You want to have marital bliss, happiness at the end of the day, that when everything has been said and done, Your story is like Disney tells us, it's life ever after that is full of happiness. But I have a message for you that comes right out of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus and to us. And while marital bliss is something that the world says, hey, you have a right for this. If you're not happy, then, you know, just forget this relationship and look elsewhere. God's design for us is not marital bliss. But it's the title of today's talk. It's marital bless. You see, God has designed us to do what we are doing today. 
It's to bless the God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms through Jesus by his spirit. And Paul will talk about how God has blessed us in the first three chapters, how we were once dead, but now we are alive in Christ. And then he speaks in the last three chapters, four, five, and six, of how that blessing we have received, we can offer back to God in this eulogy or blessing of praise to God. And it's not simply a blessing that we offer up to God, but that blessing that we offer up to God is expressed in the way that we bless one another. And so God explores how life should look like in everyday terms. And so he starts where we live the most, in our relationships. And he starts where we spend the most time at home, that we will, under the providence of God, spend the longest amount of time with face-to-face, our spouse. And God will say that I give you everything that you need by the strength and the presence of my spirit so that you could do what I want you to do, in fact, what I require you to do as a God-fearing, Jesus-loving, spirit-dependent spouse. Through the spirit filling our hearts in worship, we can fulfill our roles in marriage. And so for husbands, that means loving our wives. For wives, that means respecting your husband. And this is in real life. This is an actual time. This is right where we live. But Paul says that's a parable. That's a picture, an illustration of the greater relationship that as a husband loves his wife and as a wife respects her husband, then the world catches a glimpse of the way that you bless one another in marriage, marital bless. And the way that you bless one another is really representative. It's parabolic. It's symbolic of the blessing that you enjoy in your submission to Jesus as the leader of your life. It's a display of the blessing that we enjoy as a recipient of Jesus being the perfect groom. And that as the body of Christ, we are the bride of Christ who are the recipients and the beneficiaries of his love that that purifies and makes us more and more holy without wrinkles and without spots. I mean, people usually get more spots and wrinkles as we age, but as we walk with Jesus, we have less wrinkles and less spots and become more perfected into his likeness. All of life for a mom and dad who are married together as husband and wife comes down to two words, and those are the words love and respect. In fact, in our passage, that's where Paul ties it all together, that a husband ought to love his wife, and a wife ought to respect her husband. And so, boys and girls, this day as we have worshipped God and as we celebrated our faith in him and and the joy of what it means to know Jesus as our personal Savior, I want you to talk later today with your mom and dad about this question. How can we show greater love and respect in our family? Because that's really how the world and and your classmates and our neighbors and our relatives who are not followers of Christ, this is how they could not only hear the gospel of Jesus from us, and we want to tell the gospel to them. Like John 3, 16, that God so loved them and Jesus died on the cross for them and they need to believe in him. But we also want them to see the gospel in our family. And when we love and respect one another in our family, And we can always get a little bit better than where we are today. That as we explore how we can do this, then it's not simply preserving the order of our household or being a good son and daughter or a good spouse or a good parent, but it's to help people to understand the goodness and the grace of our God and our Savior. And even to see the power of his Spirit.
And so thanks to Auntie Faith for her love and devotion to you because she's prepared some resources that you can go ahead and jump into. So mom and dad, you could have your son or daughter or your kids go into uh, these activities prepared for us by Auntie Faith. And for all of us, you know, before we go to our passage this morning, today I recognize that for some of us, this passage is really exactly what you are ready for. Because you thank God for your spouse and you have a marriage that is healthy and that's, that's intact and that's growing and, and you wake up feeling blessed and you want to bless your spouse. And you look at a passage like Ephesians chapter 5 and you, you take this as something that is like a, like a tune-up for your automobile, like a refresher course, something that could strengthen what you already enjoy as a good, vibrant marriage. But then there are others where you're thinking, man, this is like that Passover passage where, you know, I love Ephesians 5, 1 to 21, and, and I can get around chapter 6 and the rest of the book of Ephesians, but this is the passage that, you know, to be very honest, it don't feel so good. There's a lump in my throat. There's a little reflux and, and just this gastrointestinal it don't, I don't like this. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of stomach through it, but this is the passage where it kind of raises more questions and concerns than anything else. And so before we take a deeper dive into what Paul says about marriage and our roles as a husband and a wife, I want to start with a few reality checks because I, I rec recognize that we are in different places and our life experience and where we are physically and mentally and emotionally, spiritually, are in different places. And so if you feel a little bit uneasy about what we're going to jump into, I want to address that even from the get-go. First of all, I want to give you three reality checks. The first one is singleness is a good option. In fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that we looked at last year Paul will not simply say it's a good option, but Paul, from his perspective, says it's the better option. Marriage and singleness are both good, but he gives a one-up to singleness. And he says, actually, he says, sees it's not only a better option, but it's the happier option. And yet some of you are thinking, how could it be better? How could it be happier? Because I want to be married. Singleness is not something I desire. It's not a singleness by choice. And you might be struggling with, with how do you take your singleness as something that God has designed for your good and for your benefit and even for your joy. And how can I use this time in my period of life as a single follower of Christ for his eternal kingdom benefit? The second is that some of you might feel that marriage can be extremely difficult and, you know, that story of beauty and the beast? You say, I'm the beauty and <laughs> he's the beast. Or she is like the beast. And the, re the reality is, is this is the passage I like to put in, like, large print and huge font and just leave on the pillow of my spouse. Because he needs to get right with God. She needs to take Paul's words to heart. And the reality is that marriage can be extremely difficult for some of us. And the truth be told, you're ready to give up. You might have checked into a lawyer to, to write up papers for separation, maybe even divorce. Or maybe you're sticking together with your spouse simply for the kids. And a lot of families are great parents with horrible marriages. And maybe you've checked out of your marriage years ago. And what you need from God is a word of hope. And I pray that God would give you a glimmer of hope through his word here in Ephesians chapter 5. And a third word of just a reality check is losing our spouse through divorce or death is really a painful experience. It's a loss that, that we experience every single day even if the loss happened years ago. And whether that loss was through 
the separation of a loved one who walked out of our lives that we thought would be with us forever, or someone who, that we loved and held close to our hearts and yet died, and, and that grief that we feel is still so close to the surface. I thank God for our prayer healing ministry and the divorce care and the grief share for the men and women that gather together twice a month, first and third Saturday morning of the month, because they're here to care and to support and to, to love us through our loss. Because the loss is real and the pain is deep. And there are some of us who think singleness, I don't really love it. And, or marriage, he is such a beast. How could I live with her another single day? Or that feeling of loss is just as fresh today as when it happened months or years ago. Whatever we feel and wherever we find ourselves, we know that God is wise and he's good and he is sovereign. And he is working in everything, even our singleness, even our beastly spouse, even our loss for the sake of leading us to trust him more deeply and become more conformed to the likeness of his son. So whether we feel like we're in a good position or an awkward one, I want us all to remain open to the Spirit of God and to maybe, it could be stepping back and maybe zooming out a little bit and rather than simply focusing husband and wife, but is thinking more broadly as the Spirit of God, verse 18, fills our hearts as a people of God, how can I fulfill my roles as a godly individual in the relationships that I have at home. And if that's what it takes, grab onto that. And so I'd like us to turn and tap over to Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. In verses 22 to 24, you'll notice that Paul's word to the wives is quick. It's three verses. He gets into it with amazing brevity. And he says, Respectful wives, picture our submission to Jesus' authority. And I think Paul gives the wives the benefit of the doubt. Easy in, easy out. He says it, they get it, they grab it, and go for it. For the guys, not so easy, not so short. In fact, the women get three verses. The guys get the rest of the passage. And he says, loving husbands illustrate Jesus' sacrifice for our benefit. You see, both wives and husbands, as we are full of God's spirit, then we can fulfill our responsibility toward one another. And we each have a responsibility that doesn't depend on each other, but that is entirely dependent on upon the Spirit of God working in us. And that is huge. Because a lot of times we say, well, you know, they're really a hard person to, to love, or she, she, she doesn't want to submit to him because he's not respectable. And so a lot of times we can excuse ourselves from our God-given responsibility on the basis that our spouse is just terrible. But Paul doesn't give us that out. Paul says it depends not on the quality of our spouse, not upon favorable circumstances, but he says based upon the fullness of God's spirit in our lives, then we can fulfill our responsibility in our role, whether it's a wife who submits and respects or a husband who sacrifices and nurtures. And so as we step into one of the most popular biblical passages read in weddings across the world, probably throughout history. Let's see what Paul says to wives first. And Paul will say, respectful wives, picture our submission to Jesus' authority. 22 and 23. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. 
You see, earlier in this chapter, verse 18, we saw this last week, Paul wants us to make the most of every opportunity. He says the way that we do that is we don't squander this God-given opportunity, but rather than being intoxicated or under the influence of something else, we've got to live under the influence of God's Spirit. And when we do, when the Spirit of God masters our sacred community, then we will maximize our privileged kairos, our God-given opportunity. As a church, we're going to look at the the way in which he's put us together. And we're not going to waste the sacred privilege that we share as God's people. And the way that we reject the temptation to waste our life is to live under the fullness of God's spirit. And we saw last week that that will lead us to produce musical encouragement to one another from the spirit that it'll cause us to have a continual spirit of praise and thanksgiving to the Father. And then in verse 21, we see that it also fosters mutual submission through Christ. That is, as an expression of our subordination and surrender and release, and recognition of the authority of Jesus' leadership of our life, then we know that God has placed us in this hierarchy of relationships. We're to establish, you know, peace and order in our relationships in a government, in a church, in a family, that we've got to follow those responsibilities as a leader and as one who follows. And so Paul will speak to husbands and wives and parents and children and slaves and masters and the church and our authority over Satan. And he says that that we need to recognize that the Spirit of God enables those in a position of leadership like husbands to fulfill their responsibility. But he also enables those in a position of subordination. It's not inequality. But it's a difference of role and a difference of responsibility. How he gives those who are in a a responsibility of following to fulfill their God-given role. You see, our submission to one another flows out of our relationship with Jesus. Whether it's the wives to the husbands, whether it's the children to the parents, whether it's slaves or workers to their masters, or their employers, that the submission of the wife and the child and the slave or the worker is an expression not simply to a human authority, but it's ultimately a submission and an expression of their commitment to follow the leadership and to recognize the authority of God's Messiah. That's where it follows. Paul ties our respective responsibility to how we relate with Jesus. And Paul says, with the enablement of God's spirit, wives ought to submit themselves. It never says, husbands, command your wives to submit. It's not in the sacred text. It's a voluntary, on their own decision that the wife makes. Paul says, wives, you submit yourselves to your husbands just as you do to the Lord, just as you recognize his authority, God's authority over your life. I want you to recognize that God has placed your husband as the authority over your life. And Paul is going to dig deeper into what that, the implications of that. And the greater load of responsibility on the husband to be a loving and nourishing and sacrificing leader for his wife. But here he starts with the the woman and says, wives, the responsibility that you have is very clear cut. It's to, to respect and to honor and to cherish and to value and to recognize your husband as the God-given authority in your life to provide for you, to protect you, to propel you toward greater holiness. And for the unmarried woman who desires marriage in her heart, my challenge for you is to look for that kind of man that you could respect 
as your spiritual leader. It's the kind of man that you say, well, I'm not going to struggle over this person because I see how they love God and I see how they respect the leadership of Jesus and how they depend upon the power of God's spirit. And so to respect and to submit to their authority, just as I do to God and to Jesus, that's a no-brainer because I love the way that they live. They live in the fear of God. And so for a single woman, for a married woman, we want to cherish our man as someone who is able to, they themselves, live under the authority of Christ. You see, that's the mark of a man who is worthy of respect. That they recognize that they are not the, just the ultimate boss or the one who has veto power or makes ultimatums, anything terrible like that, but that they themselves are subject to the authority and leadership of Jesus in their life. You see, for a majority of people, not only people outside the church, but even for some of us within the church, even a nice church like the Bread of Life Church, I might be getting a little bit of pushback from you, even though I can't see it. I can see it maybe through the eyes of faith. But, I, you know, there might be a little bit of reserve and reservation and maybe resistance and even defiance. Where oh, Submission, maybe that's not the best translation you're thinking. Let's just soften it where we say, you know, respect or recognize or, okay, you know, honor. But the word for submit means to submit. It's like a, it's like a private who recognizes the commanding officer that he or she serves under. There's a recognition of where we stand. There's an equality of essence. It's not a sense of, you know, our worth before God. We are equal in essence, but we have a distinct role and responsibility given to us respectively by God. And some of you may push back to the idea of submission because the person who's in authority over you, your husband, is not really respectable. They don't seem to deserve your love and your respect and your honor and your trust. And so you're looking for the exemption. You're looking for the footnote in your Bible. Maybe you want to see what the Greek really says. You know, maybe there's an exception if your husband's not a Christian or not a growing Christian or not the best Christian. That exception's not there. Maybe you're thinking, well, what if the wife has a strong personality or is more the leadership type or the husband is really committed to work, but he gives the responsibility at home to me. He's delegated that authority to me. No, there's no delegation here. It's not an exception because it's been delegated to you or you have a stronger personality than your husband. Or maybe you're thinking this really doesn't square with 2020 and our current day culture. I mean, you know, friends and family members who are not believers or even believers, they laugh at the idea of submission. I mean, they think it smacks of inequality of essence. But that's not where Paul is. Equal in essence, distinct in responsibility. And so whenever the Bible talks about submitting to authority, whether it's government or the church or the family, it's not a conditional commitment. It's a commitment even in the midst of unfavorable circumstances. Because Rome was an authority when Paul says submit to the governing authorities. Paul said even in the midst of a non-Christian spouse that I don't want you to leave. But who knows, they might come to faith in Christ because of the godly qualities of your life. Our commitment to obedience rests upon the Spirit's work within us rather than a spouse who cooperates and makes it easy to do what God expects. But having said that, I want to spell out what submission does not mean. Submission does not mean silence. It doesn't mean that you can't vocalize your opinions even if they differ from your husband. It doesn't mean that you don't have a voice in the marriage, you may not be equal in authority. You may be in a position of subordination to, their, to his God-given authority to lead. But it doesn't mean that you don't have a word that contributes. It doesn't mean that you always have to go along with everything. 
Submission does not require disobedience. If your ha- husband is asking you to do something that violates your conscience, that goes against the word of God, that your ultimate loyalty is submission and subordination, not to your husband, but to the Lord. And so you can disagree and you could choose not to submit if your husband is clearly asking you to do something that defies the will of God. And the third area is that submission never allows for abuse in any form. Verbal, emotional, physical abuse. Submission never allows for abuse. And so positively, to submit to your husband means that you show respect, that you encourage and value his leadership, that you pray that he would live faithfully before God, that you offer your wisdom, you vocalize your difference of opinion, that you don't disengage, you keep on fighting for the marriage. That's what it means to respect your husband. Verse 24, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. I love the brevity of Paul's words, 22 and 23, the instruction, what to do, why to do it. 24, the summary, quick in and quick out. He says, wives, you submit to your husbands just as you do to the Lord in everything. That is, you know, within reason, with some of those exemptions I've talked about, disobedience, abuse, no submission there. And as you submit to God, you will submit to your, wife, your husband, wives. And as you do, then you give the world around you this glimpse of what it means for us as the body of Christ to live in submission to Jesus and his authority over us as our bridegroom. And you give people an indication that, that we are not the ultimate authority, but Jesus is Lord of our lives. Ray Ortland is a pastor in Nashville, Tennessee, and he's written a book called Marriage and the Mystery of the Gospel. He says every faithful Christian marriage points beyond itself to the perfect union we all share with the Lord Jesus Christ. I love those words. He says every faithful Christian marriage points to a greater reality beyond ourselves to the perfect union that we share with our Savior. And then he comes back to us and he says, our little, little bitty, tiny, metaphorical marriages can always draw strength from the real marriage we share with our Savior. You see, the metaphor, the picture goes both ways. A godly marriage points to Jesus. But a marriage that that is struggling and that has questions and maybe where it's hard for you wives to respect and honor and cherish your husbands, that that our little marriage here on earth gains strength and draws upon the reservoir of our perfect marriage with Jesus to give us the capacity to go where we could not go in our own strength, to love our husband, to honor and to respect him in the way that God has commanded us. You know, one writer says that we live in a day in which we could call out to Alexa, we could say, hey Siri, or we could Google our question, and we love life with digital assistance. I mean, many of you, your homes are wired from corner to corner, and life is easy, it's, it's smart with digital assistance. But the remi- writer reminds us that in our digital age, it's helpful to remember the importance of real-life relationships, and the benefits of older believers that could speak truth and wisdom and support into our lives. And that's why I love Bread of Life Church English Ministry, that we are multi-generational and we could learn from one another and we could pour into each other's lives and we could be on the receiving end of wisdom and support. And so I didn't call out to Alexa or Siri or Google the secrets to a long-lasting marriage But I ask some of our couples who've been married for 30, 40, 50 years a simple question. What do you consider as a key factor 
in why God has blessed your marriage. Here's some of the wisdom, some of the insight of a few of our families, some of you. Faith in God together as partners. Trust him to bless or receive, resolve all situations. This is what they consider really the key to God, blessing their marriage. Build each other up spiritually so that we can always walk hand in hand through our earthly journey. Another empowered by the Spirit with humility, respect, and service. I love my husband with all my heart, soul, and strength as God has loved and blessed me in our marriage journey of 42 years. Have patience, trust, communication, and be supportive. Another individual, he talked about the metaphor of a two-sided marriage blessing. Side one, I love and cherish my wife as God's sacred gift to me on earth to treasure or nurture, walk alongside with. Side two, we approach our relationship with mutual respect, admiration, lightheartedness, enjoying each other as we live to serve God. Another said, when we are in unison, we are better spouses, parents, ministry workers, neighbors, and friends. Another said, our marriage works because we don't impose our will on each other. It's not forceful or demanding. We discuss things and come to a solution for us, our family and others. And these responses are both from husbands and wives. Another said, being fully supportive of each other's desire to serve in ministries that may be different from yours. And some of you have marriages where you are both actively poured out in ministry, but you have different gifts and different arenas of service. I thank God for loving me and knowing what's best for me. That God has provided her, not a perfect spouse, but a husband who is a perfect fit for her. Being able to overcome challenges by praying together and knowing God will provide a way for us to overcome these challenges. And two more, we are blessed that we can grow together to become one through God's word. And then our marriage has been blessed because of his grace. We were more blessed as we learn to love each other by following God's commands. You see the correlation between blessing and responsibility? Between blessing and obedience. Our world witnesses the dynamics of a Jesus-centered reality when we fulfill our God-given roles with spirit-empowered resources. Respectful wives, they picture our submission to the authority of Jesus. Loving husbands, we illustrate, this is what's on our shoulders, we illustrate Jesus' sacrifice for our benefit. In other words, Paul will have actually many other words for husbands. In fact, if you were to add them up, it's a three-to-one ratio. He gives about 40 words to wives and about 120 words to men. <laughs> I, I'm not making this up. This is just under the influence of God's Spirit. And so that tells me that the weight of responsibility for a good marriage is not whether or not, not the wife submits to her husband, but it's whether the husband loves his wife. Take a look at verses 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. 
You see, like the beginning of chapter 5, the one who encountered the love of Jesus on the road to Damascus when he was full of hatred toward Jesus, Paul says, be like Jesus who loves us, who loved us by giving himself up. He measures and, and quantifies, qualifies the love of Jesus Christ by the sacrifice that he offered up on the cross to you and me. And so he reiterates what he said in verse 2. And now he says here in chapter 5, later on, speaking to husbands, verse 25, I want you to be not simply living a life of love that is sacrificial, but is sacrificial just like Jesus, where you give of yourself for your spouse. And he speaks about this selfless, sacrificial, and get this sanctifying love for our spouse that causes them to become holy and blameless without blemish, without wrinkles. And it's so easy for a husband to say, look at that blemish. Look at that wrinkle. Oh, that spot. And it's so easy for us as guys, and I could say this as guys who could easily become fixated on weaknesses and magnify moles and say, this looks so big, and look at a wrinkle and say, it's a creek, you know, it's a crevice and creek in the skin that is so massive that, that we could magnify weaknesses in our spouse. And Paul says, well, you know what? Your responsibility as a husband is to help remove those wrinkles. It's to help eliminate those blemishes. It's to help remove the spots that we are, as it were, a God-fearing, Jesus-loving, spirit-influenced dermatology specialist that helps our spouse become more sanctified, to become more like Jesus. You see, Life with Jesus is not simply God saving a place for us in heaven. But life with Jesus is about loving and following Kim, where he sanctifies a people for himself on earth today. It's not just saving a spot for me in heaven forever, but it's sanctifying a people for himself today. And Paul says our responsibility as husbands is to have the sanctifying, purifying, cleansing influence on our wife so that she's radiant, that she's more like God because of our selfless, sacrificial love for them. And so Paul says rather than blaming our spouse for shortcomings, rather than magnifying weaknesses, Paul says husbands get to work sacrifice, serve, sanctify, and that the measure of our, of our strength as a husband is evidenced through the maturity and the godliness of our wife. It's through the radiance of her character. That becomes the ultimate manifestation of how good of a husband we actually are. It's not being part of a guy's small group and say, hey, how's your husband life doing? Hey, doing really good. High five, you know. Ooh, fist bump, you know, elbow bump, you know. We're doing good. We're godly husbands. No, it's what the wives share in their small group. Are they growing in their faith? Are they becoming more like Christ? Are they full of radiance or are they full of rage? Because what's on my shoulder, what's on your shoulder as husbands it's this sacrificial, serving, sanctifying love where they become more blameless, without wrinkles. It's to lead by example. And I want to give you a few recommendations about how we could lead by example. And this is a conviction that God has been driving home to me over the years. First of all, we lead by example with a commitment to character. Marriage, first, foremost, at the end of the day, and everything in between, is a commitment of character. We are faithful to our spouse because God is faithful in keeping his promises to us. A second suggestion is a flexibility of will. We don't like the word change, so I'm talking about a flexibility of will. 
This willingness to adapt, not being so set or concrete in our ways. A willingness to say yes more often. To be open to adapting, to modifying. Mutual acceptance is not a license to stay the same. But it's an atmosphere that makes change that much more desirable. A third suggestion is we lead by example with a readiness for conversation. It took me a long time to learn this, but when a wife says, let's talk, she doesn't want you to talk, she wants you to listen. When she says to you guys, let's talk, it's code word for saying, you need to listen. And it took me a long time because when Helen would say, let's talk, I said, what do, what do you want me to say? It's not so much what I can say, it's whether or not I really listen to what she says. Or do I dismiss it? Do I, you know, blow it off? Do I just disregard it? Another suggestion is the need for humility. It's not being defensive or dismissive. It's not being combative. But a need for humility says I'm open to change. And a need for humility says if I can't do it myself, I'm willing to, to reach out and to look to others for help. And then the last is an exchange of grace, where we practice forgiveness, where we give grace to one another, where we receive grace in being able to forgive when we've been wounded. Our sacrifice in marriage starts with a vision of what Jesus' love does for us. It makes us more like Christ. But our sacrifice in marriage continues through a conviction of our unique oneness. Take a look at verses 28 to the end of the chapter. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their own body, just as Christ does the church, for we are all members of one body, of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh, just right out of Genesis chapter 2. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. He's not talking about how mysterious mirrors can be. I can't understand her. He can't be figured out. No, it's the ultimate mystery of our relationship between Jesus and his bride, the church. However, verse 33, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. In a word, the foundational truth that a husband and wife are one flesh, that we are on the same team, that we are one just as much as I am one, that that is what sustains and strengthens and renews our commitment to respect and to love, to honor and to sacrifice. You see, what's at stake in our marriage is fulfilling our roles as a husband and as a wife. And what's at stake in fulfilling those roles is what people think about Jesus and our relationship with him. For the past 31 years, June 10th has become that once-a-year reminder of what I need to remember every single day. That God has given me a wife in Helen who loves me, who, who knows me, who supports me, who laughs with me, who, who, who prays for me and cherishes me more than I could ever imagine. And as I think about how God has blessed our marriage, I think about how God took six years before he gave us Christopher and then a year out to year or two after that, Jonathan. Because I think those six years before children, I had to get some things right about marriage. I remember early in our marriage, we went to a marriage conference in Houston, and we went to a workshop called How to Have a Good Fight. And we went to that because it was a creative title, it was a good speaker, and, and one of the things that I've learned in that workshop that continue to say with me is don't ever forget you're on the same team. 
You're on the same side. You wear the same jersey. You follow the same head coach. Don't, and, and that's hard to remember because when we're at war with each other, we feel like adversaries and fierce rivals and we want to win. But I was reminded early in our marriage a truth that I need to remember day in and day out that we're not rivals, we're not fierce opponents, but we're allies. We're on the same team serving the same head coach. And I hate to say this, but one of our biggest fights of all time happened at a pastor's couples conference in Dallas. I mean, this is where pastor's couples are supposed to be lovey-dovey and committed to ministry and how we praise the Lord, everyone, you know, bless one another. But we were, we were blasting, not blessing. We were not happy in the Lord. We were just trusting God to get us through this moment. And to be honest, I don't remember what happened, but I remember that we had to skip a session or two to get things right. And the reality is that I had to get things right. Because more often than not, I thought I was more godly than I actually was. And God had to get a hold of my heart and my life and say, Dan, wake up. Marriage is not about marital bliss where you try to shape and chisel Helen into your likeness where she fits into your mold, but it's about God shaping and chiseling and breaking away at your likeness so that you'll become more like my son. And to the extent that I humble myself before God, it's to that same extent that we experience marital bliss in our life together. You see, it's not a quest for our individual happiness, but it's a journey for our mutual holiness that God calls us to. Because a spirit-formed marriage that displays Jesus, a Jesus-directed relationship, it creates a God-blessed legacy. And that's what I want for myself. And that's what I want for you. Father, that is the desire of our hearts, that wherever we find ourselves today, that we would, by the fullness of your spirit, live in faithfulness to our relationships so that people would see that it's not about us, but it's about Jesus and us and the relationship we share. In Jesus' name.